Hello, my name is Dr Mary Jane Spiller and I'm a psychologist at the University of East London. I'm going to talk to you today about something called synesthesia. Um, just to give you a bit of background to myself, I'm a lecturer here at the School of Psychology. Um, I teach research methods, I teach perception, um, and my research interests are about, about how we make sense of the world around us. So I'm really interested to know how we take in all our sensory information, everything from our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our nose, our, our sense of touch, um, and how our brain then, then uses that information to, to build up our, our representation of the world around us. Um, so psychologists have been studying this for decades now. Um, there's lots of information available about how different parts of the brain process our different senses and, and so on. Um, but something that's becoming more and more um, sort of prevalent within the research at the moment is how our brain works at a sort of multi-sensory level. So if you think about it, we don't just see things, we don't just hear things. In our everyday experience, we have a multi-sensory experience. So when we're seeing things, we're also hearing things at the same time um, and research shows how our, our vision can, can affect what we hear, our vision can affect what we taste um, and so on, um, and also what we hear can affect what we taste uh, and you know all the interactions that are possible. One of the questions that um, has fascinated me and I know a lot of you are going to be fascinated by is like do we all experience the world in the same way? So is my experience of seeing things, tasting things the same as someone else's experience of seeing things and tasting things? Um, so, you know, you can talk to your friends about this, um, you can get some ideas, we use similar language to describe things. Um, but something that I find really fascinating is um, a condition called synesthesia. Now, synesthesia is something that about approximately two to four percent of the population experience. So chances are, um, for example, if you've got 100 friends on Facebook or whatever, you, you, you probably know a couple of people who have synesthesia without even realising sometimes that you, you know these people have it. Um, sometimes I talk to people who are in their 40s, their 50s, and they've only just found out that they have synesthesia. So um, it's something that we we sort of can have without, without realising that we do, if you see what I mean. Because for people who have synesthesia, it just seems normal. It's just part of their normal experience of the world around them. So what is synesthesia? Um, someone who has synesthesia, for example, might experience colours when they're hearing me talk right now. So as I'm saying different words, they might be having different um, visual colour experiences. Other people with synesthesia, um, words and sounds might induce tastes. Um, some people with synesthesia, if they, um, if they touch something, then they might get colour experiences. If they um, taste something, they might get um, touch experiences. So there's different combinations um, of our senses and for these people this is just normal. They've had it for as long as they can remember. So we talk about it as being neurodevelopmental so it's, it's something they've had as far back as they can remember um, and it's for most people with synesthesia it's something that they, they they might they might not even notice it, they might enjoy it. Generally speaking most people do not find it a problem. Um, so why are we interested in it? We're interested in studying something um, like synesthesia because it, it, it gives us an idea of, of how our brain can work in different ways. And I think it's a really excellent example of how we can experience the world in different ways. So when you're listening to music, you might just be hearing the music. Someone else, when they're listening to music, gets all kinds of you know lovely colour visual experiences in, in, in their eyes as well. Um, so it, are these experiences real? Uh, for these people who have synesthesia, how do we know um, that it's um, that they're not just making it up? How do we know that it's not just metaphorical? How do we know that it's 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 as they describe it? And so this is something that we as um, scientists have been um, studying over the years. One way that we do this is through something called a um, test of consistency. So basically what we're interested in is are people's experiences consistent over time? Um, so if someone has, for example, different colours for different letters of the alphabet, um, if I was to ask them exactly what colour do you see for each letter of the alphabet or for each of these series of words I'm showing you or numbers or, or whatever it is, um, and then if I ask them a few months later, do they have exactly the same colours? 
And with synesthetes, we find that they are very consistent generally. So if they've got a certain shade of red for the letter A, and often synesthetes are very um, precise about exactly what colour goes with each letter or which colour goes with each sound or whatever, um, then chances are two, three months later, they'll have exactly the same colour experience for that, for that uh, thing that I've shown them. In contrast, if we have people and we say to you, OK, I'm going to give you a memory test. I want you to assign certain colours to all of these letters, all of these sounds, and I'm going to ask you again in two weeks. Chances are you will not be as consistent. So um, there's, there's our consistency measure. Um, another thing that we've been able to do is look at the brain activity in people who have synesthesia and compare it to people who do not have synesthesia. And we find that when people are experiencing synesthesia, they have different brain activity in the areas that we, we kind of would predict to have based on their, their description of their experiences. So to give you an example, um, if someone has coloured words, then when they're, when they're hearing words, the parts of the brain that are normally activated by colour also become activated when they hear those words. So it shows that there is the, um, the same kind of brain activity as we'd, we'd expect as if they were seeing those colours. So we've got a couple of measures there that kind of we can use to look at, um, you know, how someone's synesthesia um, is um, consistent and then also if they have the same brain activity. We can also look at the impact that the synesthetic experiences have on their ability to do things. Um, so there's a famous um, example of a task called a Stroop task that a lot of psychologists use. So if I was to show you the word red written in blue ink and your job is to say the colour of the ink that is written in, you get slowed down by the fact that it's the word red. Um, so that's the that's the basic Stroop task. And so with synesthetes, we can look at using their, their synesthetic colours for letters and we can show them, for example, if they have a red A, we can show them a red A and we can say, what colour is it? They'll be very fast, they'll say red. But if we show them a blue A, they'll be slowed down because their kind of their mind is, is expecting it, is, is seeing it as a red A, but actually we're showing them the blue A. So it's a sort of measure there of looking at how their, their, um, their synesthesia is interfering with their ability to do a task. Um, so that would be something that someone who doesn't have synesthesia wouldn't, wouldn't experience. They would be just as fast to say if a letter was red or blue, because for them, letters don't normally have colours, whereas a synesthete, it would have a colour. Um, it's involuntary. So for people with synesthesia, the experiences happen without any extra effort. So it's not something that they have to think about to experience. It just happens. Um, and also, interestingly, they, they, um, they're they're idiosyncratic. So synesthesia often runs in families. We think it's got a genetic basis. Um, but if you get two members of the same family who happen to have the same form of synesthesia, so they both have um, coloured sounds, for example, one say um, the mum might have a particular shade of pink for the for one note, whereas the daughter or the son might have a completely different colour for that same note. So, you know, it, there isn't any kind of like exact letters to um, or sounds, but there are there are patterns. We have found interestingly there are patterns. So there generally seems to be certain letters are more likely to be certain colours, but it's not it's not exact. So I mentioned there's something about genes. So um, what do we think causes synesthesia? Well, we think it's got a genetic basis. There's, it definitely seems to run in families. Um, so if you are a synesthete, chances are someone in your family may experience synesthesia. It might not be the same form as you, so you might have coloured days of the week. Um, your, your auntie or someone um, might have um, what we call time-space synesthesia, which is when thinking of certain moments in time has spatial locations around their body. Um, so it runs in families, so it has a genetic basis and research is ongoing at the moment to look to see what genes might be involved. Um, it definitely seems to be um, a, a condition that involves many genes and there's similarities between the genes involved in synesthesia and also it's thought with autism as well. Um, so that's what we think is likely to be the cause. I've already mentioned about brain activity as well. So there seems to be something different between the brains of synesthetes and non-synesthetes. So people who have synesthesia seem to have extra connections in their brain. Um, and these extra connections are in the areas of the brain that are involved in processing the synesthesia, but also interestingly in other areas of the brain as well. Um, and there seems so there seems to be sort of widespread differences between the brains of synesthetes and non-synesthetes. 
Um, and that has also been shown in terms of our, the impact of synesthesia on other abilities. So other what we call cognitive abilities, so synesthetes memories, uh, maybe their creativity, their abilities to imagine things in their mind's eye, their mental imagery, all of those things seem to be um, enhanced in people with synesthesia compared to people who did not have synesthesia. Um, there's some very famous examples of people with synesthesia who have amazing memories and abilities to recall. Um, but even um, on a general level, if you get a group of synesthetes, um, they seem to outperform non-synesthetes on memory tests. And that's not just memory tests relating to their form of synesthesia. So, for example, if you've got colours for words, you might be really good at remembering word lists. Or if you've got colours for numbers, you might be really good at remembering numbers. But interestingly, it seems that synesthetes memory advantage goes to other areas of memory as well. That's not just related to their form of, of um, memory. This is the same with their mental imagery. So synesthetes, this is my own interest, um, what, what I've done research in and published in. When we imagine things in our minds, some people have very vivid pictures in their minds. Other people, not so much. If I, you know, if I ask some people to imagine a picture of, I don't know, their mum's face, they might just say, well, I know I'm thinking of my mum, but I don't actually see anything. Whereas other people, there's a very clear, vivid picture in their mind's eye. So that's what's called mental imagery. And it seems that synesthetes have um, better than non-synesthetes mental imagery. And that's not just in the areas the, the what we call modalities, the sense modalities, so visual, auditory, sound and so on, that are related to their synesthesia, it's sort of um, uh, across the board. Um, so yeah, synesthesia um, is something that is fascinating. Um, it affects, like I said, about two to four percent of the population, maybe slightly more. It's something that seems to run in families. It's something that is perceptually very real, like, so if you have synesthesia, it seems to, um, um, it can have very real qualities. Um, I mentioned about creativity and synesthesia, and you may read about some famous synesthetes um, who are artists or musicians or writers. Um, so it seems to that people with synesthesia tend to be more found in the creative industries. Um, and it can be very beneficial for things like memory, mental imagery as well. Um, so, yeah, we're very interested in synesthesia. And if you want to know more, please do feel free to get in touch with me. And if you have synesthesia and you want to sort of tell me about it or take part in research, again, I would love to hear from you. And thank you for listening to my talk about synesthesia. Thank you.